Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, Deconstructing Identity as a Cyber Attack Vector, featuring two of the world's foremost thought leaders on IAM and PAM. And they're also co-authors of their new book, which they'll be covering today, Identity Attack Vectors. Maury Haber and Darren Rolls. We're super excited to have them here today. Um, uh, today's webinar is also going to be led and emceed by Mike Kaiser from SailPoint, and he's going to kick things off after I run through just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, all attendee lines are muted, but we encourage you guys to keep this interactive, so please submit your questions live through the GoToWebinar console. You should find that on the side of your screen, and then we will cover questions during our live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a follow-up email containing links to the recording and slides um, within about 24 hours from now. The slides can also be immediately downloaded via the handout section in the console, again, to the side of your screen. So it's time to jump in. So I'd like to welcome Mike Kaiser from SailPoint to the line to kick things off. Hey, Mike, welcome. Take it away, please. Thank you very much. And as she said, we're very pleased to have Morey and Darren here with us uh, this morning to grab uh, some of their time. Um, and first off, I'd like to just kind of let them introduce themselves and kind of their background um, that led them to authorship in this case. Morey, would you like to go first? Thanks, Mike. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Morey Haber. I'm the CTO and CISO for Beyond Trust. I've uh, been with the organization about 17 years through a couple of acquisitions. And uh, this is, as we'll be discussing, a third book in the series and proud to have co-authored it with Darren. Darren? Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Darren Rolls. Um, I am the CTO here at SailPoint, been with SailPoint uh, for many years now. And um, up until April of last year, I was also our CISO. So <laughs> Mario and I have had a very uh, consistent and similar uh, experience in, in being both responsible for internal technology and internal security and a very interesting mix. And Gosh, I can tell you the amount of fun conversations we've had about how difficult that is, but um, it's been fun and glad to be here this morning. I can only imagine it. It's nice to have a, a dual expertise of technology and practical implementation of security infrastructures, which, uh, you know, the book and the book series is all about attack vectors, right? Could, could you all talk a little bit more about what an attack vector is and, and what this book series is about in general? Certainly. So when we thought about this whole series, we were thinking about how people are compromised or how assets are compromised or how an account is compromised. And it gave us a very high level concept that we kind of refer to as the three pillars of cybersecurity. When you think about every protection strategy, every product you purchase or every security discipline, it falls into one of these three buckets, asset, privilege or identity. So when you go buy an antivirus solution or you're worried about someone breaking into an application or an operating system, you're basically protecting the asset, the operating system, the resource, the application. The next attack vector is privileges. You're really worried about privileged abuse. Who has access to what data? What can they see? What can they export? What they can do with sensitive data? Well, that's also another one of these pillars. And then finally, as the topic of this webinar and the book, identity. Because if you own someone's identity and the accounts associated with them, you can cause all sorts of havoc. And protecting a person's identity and the accounts associated with them is an attack vector that all organizations need to manage. So when you think about any type of threat and any type of solution you purchase, they really fall into these three buckets. Because you want to know, is whatever activity occurring appropriate? Or is whatever the threat actor or potential insider, employee or other, inappropriate? Yeah, and I think um, just to throw a little color onto that, I think this is an interesting classification uh, model in effect, or, or, or as Murray Chang touched on there, when you look at products, to try and understand uh, security products, the things that we both as CISOs, or myself as an ex-CISO, have, have acquired from the industry, right? You're buying everything from anti-malware through to advanced identity management and governance solutions. Where do they fit in here? How do they um, cover these areas of potential attack? So an interesting classification model. And it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, there might be some bleed over in some of these definitions. You think of IoT or a robotic process automation might be involved in, in multiple. Yeah, exactly. So just an interesting way of thinking about it. 
There is, and this is where the, the concept for the books came really out. Because when you think about buying any of these solutions or the attack vectors that you may experience, you really want to find something that crosses as many of those three as possible. But from a discipline standpoint, we basically created the three books and uh, the last book focusing in on identity and co-authored with Darren uh, as the expert in this space. Yeah, it's a um, uh, great pleasure to, um, to, to work with you say that officially now, Mark. It was a, uh, a pleasure and an easy thing uh, for us to do. We work together as companies and we work together as professionals. And, and so this was very much in my backyard, right? It, it, this does cover where we touch um, attack vectors and um, privilege in general. And it's really around how those things come together from an identity perspective. So, yeah. All right. So, so maybe I'll really just kick off here. Oh, sorry, no, Murray, this is yours. Go for it. Yeah, no worries. So really, when you think about it um, and you look at the statistics of attack vectors, 90 percent of vulnerabilities are associated with excessive admin rights, which means that if you can really remove admin rights, you basically can mitigate the threats from vulnerabilities. And 80 percent of breaches are the result of privileged account abuse or misuse. So when we think about an identity and the associated accounts, those accounts that are privileged in nature are the ones that are being targeted by threat actors. But you can't just manage those alone. And that's really what privilege access management does, but it really is not a complete picture because with modern threats, they do target the privileges, they do target the assets, and you have to roll them all together in terms of a formal identity governance model, and that's where things get interesting. And that's why we are looking at it as an identity attack vector. The attack chain itself is quite straightforward. If you first start in number one, think about the threats that you face. These are insiders, whether intentional or unintentional or malicious, and then external threats, opportunistic, nation state, uh, bots, whatever it may be, probing your exterior, finding a way to come in. And once they do come in and land that beachhead, they're looking for some form of privileged escalation. They want to get to those admin accounts. Once they get to those admin accounts, they can then jump to the identity and try to own other accounts. That's why it's so important in terms of what we're doing here today. But truly, there's only two way to get privilege escalations, only two, a vulnerability and exploit combination or a privileged attack vector. Once they do get those privileges, they own that account and the associated identity. They're gonna move laterally through your environment to find more opportunity. They're going to try to find other resources, other assets, other applications, other accounts associated with other identities and probe the entire environment to steal even more credentials. In the meantime, dropping malware, creating accounts, changing settings, deleting log files, whatever they need to do to stay under the radar. And then eventually steal data or create some type of havoc within the organization to take them offline. And, and I think um, that the old phrase that, uh, uh, you know, why do robbers rob banks? Because right? where the money is. Why is identity and privilege under attack? Because it is the control model that gives access to the data. And so this escalation chain is, is something that repeats itself um, when you look forensically at attack. It's pretty much, it's always there, one form or another. So it's a pretty interesting place to be. And so the attack factors then are distributed throughout uh, this attack chain or... Are they more localized in one area? Yeah, they are actually. And in chapter two of the book, just to give you guys a bit of a lead in, um, where we discuss the nuances of, of lateral movement, that's kind of what this slide is, is really covering for you, is where it comes in. Whereas in uh, chapter 10, um, we talk a little more about the methods and the tactics. And as Mari said, you know, how somebody's going to gain a privilege and escalate it, how, how is that actually happening? And then in chapter 11, we really in detail talk about IAM in that cyber kill chain. I think many many of our listeners would have heard of the um, uh, Norfolk Grumman introduced that notion of a formal um, uh, uh, kill chain. Um, and in chapter 11, we, we kind of discuss, uh, okay, in that chain from infiltration through to exfiltration, where are these things being used? You know, where is an operating system exploitation or an unmanaged account or or something, um, this is actually a table from the book, um, uh, it being used. And I think having that visibility over where attack 
uh, touches identity can help you uh, target the solutions, help you justify buying the solutions. It's just a, a good place to understand the vulnerability in its chain. So plenty of good information on that um, uh, across the books. And then just finally, in chapter 18, uh, we do cover the threat response. So how do you respond to this once there is some issue? How do you um, uh, recover from uh, any of the uh, uh, lateral movement in any of these areas? So really trying to give some practical advice in the book and, and some perspective around that. Yeah, and it's quite interesting, Darren, because we've seen this attack, attack vector evolve. I mean, it's simply if, if you own a one identities account for email and you hit forget passwords, you could potentially own other accounts or other uh, associations with it, including their privileged accounts if, you know, forgot password is something that's readily available. But what makes it even more scary is the way this is evolving, because with modern techniques like simjacking and poor solutions that use 2FA with SMS texting, you now have another attack vector that's evolving where, send me a text message. Well, it's 2FA, but it's insecure through text, and I've simjacked you. I now own that account, and then I can start moving around your accounts to own the identity as well. So the whole concept here is, is, look, if I can get a hold of one account with whatever privilege is possible, I could potentially own your identity and the attack vectors become wider and wider as we essentially move through next generation technology. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, um, how many times have we all heard the words that identity is now at the center of security? Um, convenient for us both as vendors, I'm sure, because we are in that space, but it is true. If you, if you track the adversary, and you track the attack uh, tactics that are used, identity is now uh, seen as both a, a, a weapon to use against us and a place of vulnerability. So, yeah, hence why we wrote the book. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good lead-in. Can we, can we hear more about, you know, identity-specific process or identity-specific attack vectors? We've talked about kind of the general process, but uh, getting more into the meat of the book here, maybe, could, uh, Darren, could you give us a little more information on Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, again, to reference you back to it, if you um, obviously we encourage you to uh, download or, or buy a copy of the book. Um, but uh, in chapter three, we really start uh, giving a framework for understanding where identity fits into an overall uh, chain of compliance and, uh, and controls. And generally speaking, um, we like to use this five A's model, where authentication, authorization, administration, analysis. Uh, and audit are really the five principal disciplines um, that we think of as covering um, in, um, in identity management and specifically in identity governance. And so authentication simply, you know, how do we authenticate? Lots of technology there around um, strong authentication. Um, authorization, I personally feel as being the really um, difficult thing to get right. Authentication is somewhat binary. Authorization is the complexity of who should have access and why. Administration is simply what we do, right? Uh, what well, both uh, Beyond Trust and SailPoint do. We're in the process of making administration more functional and then providing the analytics and the specifically for SailPoint, the audit that covers over it. So we've got a, a nice um, uh, introduction to that in chapter, in chapter three, which helps people understand uh, exactly how it all fits together. And then just I'll, I'll hand this over to uh, to, to Mori because I know he's also involved with the IDSA, IDSA Alliance. Uh, we're both um, uh, on the board. Uh, this is a, just a nice classification picture that helps us understand where the things that we do um, as businesses and the references that we make during the book fit into a broader uh, identity fi uh, defined security alliance. Mori, anything there? Thanks, Darren. So if we consider even this standardized model or any other model that you may see that covers identity and access, you'll find that identity governance as a PAM, excuse me, as an identity governance solution or PAM as a privileged access management solution are both subsets of basically identity management. And when you link the two together, you kind of figure out rather quickly, but not always obvious, that PAM is a subcase, a special subcase. It's when the accounts that you're managing as an identity have privileged access and they need to be treated with an additional sensitivity. So when you engage with single sign-on or two-factor authentication, PAM doesn't care, privileged access doesn't care, and not at all. It's just that the account that you're using has even higher privileges to look at sensitive data and it warrants additional investigation, more controls, tighter regulations, and when you roll it back up to identity governance, you want to make sure that 
your certifications are as dead accurate as possible, only giving privileged rights to the right people. If someone changes departments, they're promptly removed and you can certify that, especially when someone leaves the organization. So when you consider it from this type of model perspective, we're talking about humans, we're talking about bots that may have traits like a male robot or others that are you know, personified in the physical world and the two link together. So consider identity as the top level where identity access management and privilege access management are subcategories that work hand in hand to support the identity. Right, and I think understanding what vendors don't do is, is often as important as understanding what they do. Um, you know, that's pretty clear what we do, right, in, in that picture, so. And so, a quick question, follow up for both of you. As in your CISO role, um, do you fill in gaps like this? Do you look for solutions that, that are unified or work together? What's your general philosophy on pulling those together? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we drink our own champagne. It's, uh, we don't eat dog food. We drink our own champagne um, in in that realm. But yeah, I mean, I'm personally um, a strong believer in understanding what solutions don't do. Um, as vendors, we're, we're always guilty of going, oh, we do it all. We do everything. We like these nice big fluffy borders around what our solutions cover because it, it you know, the reps don't want you to not do that. But understanding clearly what something is and should do and what it doesn't uh, is almost a was a guiding philosophy for me. Um, so if you, you know, endpoint security is that. Right? I, I agree with that. Code One code. of the uh, first tasks that I was given as the CISO for the organization uh, was merging all four companies together. And if you're not familiar, in 2018, Beyond Trust became a company of Baumgar, Avecto, Lieberman, and the former Beyond Trust. And reconciling all of the security policies, all of the tools, and deploying our own product across an organization that literally almost quadrupled its size was paramount and you have to drink your own serpain. You really realize quickly, wow, um, I need to do this better. I need to change this. I need to make it less, have less friction for user adoption or, or anything along those lines. So when considering how you manage identities and privileged access, um, ask yourself one question when you talk to vendors, do they use their own products? Do they trust their own solutions? And hopefully they say yes, because it is so important that they understand um, the pains of potentially rolling out a product to support these initiatives just like they do themselves. And I think maybe, Murray, you and I have started a trend here, something that I think it would be beneficial to see more of. Um, I'm obviously now the ex-CISO, but, um, but uh, being actually responsible for your internal security gives you a perspective on what the real customer does. It's, it's easy yes. to sit on a tower and say, hey, you should do this, but be in program. And if any of our listeners this morning are that CISOs, I have my, I want to give you a hug and uh, make, you know, make sure you're getting all the coffee you need this morning because it's one tough job, no doubt. It is. So that's that's helpful clarification to to see that identity is kind of the overall umbrella, and then privileged access and identity governance are kind of two pieces of that. Now let's drill a little more detail into each one of those, if we could. Sure. Um, start maybe with Darren talking about identity governance and its implications. Yeah, and I'll keep this, um, uh, if you could just build out, there's one more build on there. So oh, yeah, yeah, just to, um, I, I won't give this uh, too, too much. You could, uh, uh, chapter uh, six in the book is actually identity governance defined. Um, we like to give a, a very clear definition of, of what uh, identity governance's purpose in, in the identity and access management chain is. Um, fundamentally is answering these three questions. Uh, who currently has access? Uh, what is the current state of uh, access and access through authentication and authorization? Um, and then answering uh, what is a more complex and difficult business uh, question to answer and who should have access? Should that person have it? How and why? And then to look at how that access is actually being used throughout uh, a long, what turns out to be a long life cycle. Um, they sound like very simple, clear, easy questions to ask, but um, uh, being able to answer that across an entire organization is, is very difficult. And so uh, we tend to start with the principle of having to understand the relationships between things. And this is a great area where uh, our PAM and identity governance solutions fit together as hand in glove, being able to correlate, being able to understand uh, how a particular administration account is given to somebody, 
uh, who that person is, what their rights are for it, and controlling it through a life cycle. But being able to do that for all accounts and access. And really, that's our goal uh, and our purpose in the ecosystem. There is no fluff around that. There is no question and, and uh, ambiguity. Identity governance's job is to map, track, and understand uh, the relationships. And then, of course, again, I don't want to go through this. Uh, several of you will obviously on the on the line will probably be fully aware of what we do. But um, uh, we do in the book give a very clear uh, definition on uh, what identity governance is and how it's used through a full life cycle. And we tend to think of that from um, you know cradle to grave, as it were, how a first accounts are assigned and put in place right the way through uh, a life cycle management that involves um, policy management and certification and and uh, data and access uh, data governance and access requests. So um, look for in the book a very good, clear, not really vendor specific. I think we you know I think both Mario and I uh, have tried to be very generic and, and understand what these capabilities mean broad, more broadly, but um, a very clear definition uh, in what that means for identity governance. Thanks, Darren. Um, and Maury, could you take us down the path of privilege management and exploring that a bit? Certainly, Mike. So let's first ask the question of why is this a special case of identity governance? And when we talk about privilege access requirements, we really have expanded it into uh, an explosion type of problem. It is the explosion of privileged accounts everywhere. If you consider just a few years ago, um, let's even go back 20 years ago, we were still dealing with Windows 98 or even ME. You may have only had one or two admin accounts on that entire system, yourself and maybe someone else, the help desk or whoever imaged the system. Today, you're probably dealing with at least two or three dozen privileged accounts. And if you think that's nuts, think of all the vulnerability patch, service accounts, endpoint protection, log management, and all the web-based consoles and all the internal consoles and the help desk and remote access, all of those privileged accounts used to just administer your laptop. Well, you know what? We've got privileged accounts everywhere. And it's not just the endpoint, it's on the server, it's in the cloud, it's everywhere. So we're now thinking about privileges in terms of requirements, there's so much more than just passwords in a vault. You have to be able to ask, can I pass my audits? Can I have minimal amount of privileged accounts? Can I remove privileged accounts from servers? Can I remove admin rights on my desktops? Can I integrate with my identity governance solution? So when they're doing that joiner, mover, lever process, that cradle to grave, I can actually map those proper identities to the accounts who has privileged access in real time and only make those changes once in a governance solution. But Pam understands it right then and there down to who should have access and where. So when we talk about so much more than passwords in a vault, you now have that special case of, okay, I am doing privileged access. I need to be able to answer those questions from identity governance. Was the access appropriate? Did they do anything malicious in that particular piece? Did they do something that I should be aware of and on whatever target? So it leads us to a journey. Where do you need to start? Removing admin rights on a desktop, on a server? Am I gonna start by integrating into identity governance and controlling those special accounts with the keys to the kingdom or the keys to the cloud? Or am I gonna start with my automation and my dev team as they publish code rapidly to the cloud? You really can start anywhere in the privilege access management journey and manage these accounts. But if you start doing that without that linkage to identity governance as a goal or from day one, you're literally operating as two separate systems. And that's why the identity attack vector piece is so critical so that you can bring them together and have that certification, that attestation reporting of who should have access and then use privilege access to determine exactly what they did to make sure it's appropriate. And that's why they work together. Yeah, and I think a, a, an air gap between those solutions is something that the adversary is looking for. Um, there's a lot of evidence that now shows that um, the adversary knows the solutions that the average enterprise is deploying, both of ours. Um, and boy, those two solutions better be working closely together because, you know. So, so by air gap, you mean they're hoping for separate efforts they're hoping for a separation of product and a lack of integration and a lack of understanding of these connections between the privileged account, which we may help 
um, uh, create and its management and use in its life cycle, which a PAM solution will help. Um, and, uh, and as Murray very uh, articulately put it there, it's understanding the life cycle. Right? Um, and the adversary knows if there's gaps. And so does the auditor these days, which is kind of um, kind of interesting. So I think what we've evolved to is um, is it is a, a broader view of understanding that these two solutions must be connected together and having um, a visibility and a control plane that spans the solutions, it's pretty much required. Uh, back to the comment earlier of knowing what you don't do. Um, Cellpoint does not do privileged account management. There should be no question in anybody's mind about that. Um, but it's our job to integrate with it in a more than seamless fashion. So us working together on this book was really just a, an extension of us working together in, in real life. Right? So um, that visibility is key, right, Murray? I would agree with that. And this is something that uh, we readily hear from, from our clients like yourselves out in the field. And it's so much more than just the visibility of, hey, we went from that junior mover lever process or that cradle to grave, because the visibility is wherever privileged accounts can exist, whether they're being pulled from a password safe, whether they are temporarily given to an endpoint to perform a specific task or maintenance, whether that's a vendor or contractor who's now been granted access to come in from the outside, the internet, the wild, and perform professional services or maintenance or anything like that. And then all the automation. I mean, if we just take remote access alone as a use case most people don't think about, you bring vendors and contractors in or even remote employees in all the time to help, whether they're contracted to perform a professional services gig for a specific solution or they're performing maintenance on a complex application because you don't have the resources internally. How do they get those privileged accounts? They get them from PAM. How did you grant them an account and an identity to ensure proper access? That's identity governance. How do you make sure they did the right things and didn't drop malware or try to move inappropriately laterally? That's the visibility of the two solutions working together. And that's why Beyondtrust doesn't do identity and access just as well, but that visibility is key for you to keep an eye and make sure you're the next, not the next target from a threat actor. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, to give you a reference back, I mean, in the several chapters of the book, we really have tried to focus on where um, that integration helps you meet regulatory compliance in Chapter 8, um, if you're tracking it, um, and generally across the board, uh, how to, to seal those air gaps and, and have the solutions work well together. But it's fascinating because um, it's not only you need a strong CISO or strong direction from an IT directing component, security directing component, but there's also a, a technological aspect to it too, correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, choose the right vendors, choose the right integration. And I think um, the slide that's now up for you guys, just a bit of an eye chart, but um, you know, look for standards ways of those things integrating. Um, uh, if you're not aware of SKIM, uh, the System Cross Domain Identity Management, um, an RFC that covers uh, how to make and use uh, identity change requests between systems, is pretty much how these things should be plumbed together. Uh, and so we do cover that in chapter 16 in the book. You have a pretty good um, cover on what SKIM is, uh, why it's important, and then really why your identity governance and PAM solution should be plumbed together using this standard. Uh, that's how we integrate together and it, it is how uh, all solutions should uh, over a very simple and standards-based uh, connection model. Uh, which stops you from being locked into vendors and, and gives you, uh, when you really get into the detail, a lot better ways of tracking what's happening on your network. Right? If your identity governance solution is uh, giving someone um, access to a new vault, let's have that going over a standard security protocol that we know we can trust. And I've heard from a lot of, uh, from several CISOs like yourselves that talk about uh, getting into version control nightmares when they do things you know, an integration with another vendor, but it's not in a standards format, is that fair to say? Exactly. And there is a standard here for it. Um, it's uh, very clear and I must say very simple. So for us to work together, we, we, it, it's really just follow the spec. Pretty, pretty clear. So it sounds like uh, the two of you have put in a lot of effort along with SailPoint and Beyond Trust to kind of unify your efforts in this area. Yeah, um, it, it's a... Uh, 
it's almost a standard pattern these days, right? Um, folks are going to look for uh, an identity governance leader and they're going to look for a privileged access management uh, vendor leader in that space. And, uh, you know, uh, Mario and I work together very closely. That's just how, how, how it ends up working um, throughout that life cycle. And as we, you know, the prompts at the bottom really, you know, automating that access, centralizing the management and reducing risk is pretty much what drives most of our customers to come to us both. Right, Mario, would you agree? I'd agree. And Darren, you know, I just thought of something and I know we didn't discuss it. You and I first started having these conversations back in 2013, uh, almost seven years ago. Uh, I remember a meeting that almost didn't happen and we were trying to discuss how to how these things came together. And uh, that visibility slide that the team just saw has gone through several versions, but it's essentially the same. And the main point about it was to automate access between the solutions to find a way that the maturity of identity governance could be realized by companies and have that centralized management we've been discussing for either use case. Um, the partnership has been great since then, and we share a lot of ideas, not only from the CTO identities perspective, but also some of the war stories that we have uh, both as CISOs. And the main goal for us was to reduce risk internally and for our mutual clients. So that partnership, not only working at the top level, but between the two organizations has been uh, really good to explain to you and why it should be so powerful as a part of your strategy to solve these attack vector problems. Exactly, and, and I think um, you know we, we thank both of our companies for our support around this webinar. Um, it's been, uh, and, and the process here, we wrote the books as individuals, to be honest with you, in that respect. Um, we obviously represent our companies. Uh, so don't don't take this to read that it's a it's a vendor book because it's actually very very independent and I think that um, we did a good job at just trying to capture what it means um, to look at these two principal technologies in you know, in the real world. Agreed. And you when you do when you do go read through it, I think you'll find that we don't call out our vendor specific technology. We don't call out our own company names. I think you'll find this to be a fantastic guidance on how to secure identity attacks, privileged attacks, to solve the real world problems you face. Uh, look at it as just um, two companies with expertise in this area have put together something as best practice guidance for you to understand your risks and how to solve them. How would the two of you describe uh, your target audience for this book? I mean, it, it, I've read some of it. I've been in the industry for a while. It, it seemed like it was a mix of, yeah. of introduction yet in-depth content as well. I think it's always difficult to try and target a single audience for that. I, I think it would be um, foolish for us to not to give a good introduction to every topic that's in there, but it is a, a fairly expert view in that respect. So I think anybody that's looking at or is responsible for IAM program, this gives a very good definition of what the technologies are and where they fit together. I think uh, an actual uh, detailed practitioner as well. Um, you know, Mari and I, are, sounds a little, we are experts in this field, right? This is all we do, you know, I don't know a lot about anything <laughs> else. All we do. I know a lot about this. Um, uh, so I still think there, are, you know, we cover some very interesting ways of how to think about the technology and how to isolate parts of it such that it's successful in deployment. And that's what really counts. So I think it's pretty broad. It is. And I would say I, I, I would add to that beginner intermediate. Um, we do have a couple of jokes in there, a couple of Easter eggs that you'll find here and there, a uh, little bit of personal touch. So, look, if you're just trying to understand the space in general, I think you'll find it a great read. If you want a good laugh and a couple of good Google searches to get even further of a laugh, you'll find them in there as well. Great. And there's a there's a book signing at RSA. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We have a, a couple of questions. Uh, from our listening audience that have been wrapped in attention. Excellent. The two of you holding forth, that's kind of expected. Um, uh, first question, this book is a great start um, and provides some in-depth material. How do they make the transition, especially the two of you as CISOs or former CISOs, how do they make that transition from theory into praxis? From, there's a great idea, I want to achieve it. How do they move that actually into production in their environment? Yeah, I think um, uh, we did actually try and give some clear guidance on program uh, in the book as well. How to think about program, because a lot of the time it's a human problem. 
Uh, it's not just technology, right? We we're the, we are market leaders in our spaces. We go 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 read the magic quadrants and understand that. But how do you approach it from a human perspective? How do you uh, put together a governance committee? How do you put together a group of people that are responsible in your organization? Who should be on that committee? Should it just be the boss? Should it be, you know? So we try to give a little bit of advice in, in the book to cover that. Um, but ultimately, I think anybody that's looking seriously at these technologies is, is engaging uh, with a practice partner, uh, with a consulting organization. Um, fortunately, none of this is rocket science anymore. It's fairly well understood how to think about program and how to put it in place. And um, I think a smaller organization can just jump straight in with the product. And I think the larger organizations take a consulting approach. I'd agree with that. And uh, I would also emphasize the crawl, walk, run strategy here. Um, if you don't have any methodology around this, getting the help will get you a long way. If you're inclined to try it yourself uh, and learn, um, I would start with something as technology simple as discovery. Um, if you don't know where your accounts are, you don't even know where your privileged accounts are, there's no way you're going to be able to measure, monitor, or even build a program. So from a technology perspective, you got to start at least knowing what you don't know. And when you find out, wow, I am not getting rid of people when they leave the organization, or I have accounts or systems from people that have been gone for years, getting that help on the third party or trying to do it yourself, regardless of how you do it, you, you got to first identify how big of a problem you got and then essentially map a plan to solve it. Um, but I would never, as a CISO, be ashamed to go to an outside party to help uh, an SI, a VAR, um, someone with that expertise, because it's impossible to know everything in this space. As Darren and I have indicated, we're experts in this space, but certainly I'm not an expert in a lot of adjacent areas, and nor would I try to be. I rely on people that are. Yeah, I agree. And I think the two words which we cover a little in, in Chapter 12, if you're following from the book perspective, um, you know, understanding the difference between a program and a project is obviously a great, and I think that's pretty much what Mari just said, right? Understand that this is bigger than just a deploying a piece of technology and understand how that uh, program will evolve over time involving these technologies is key. I would be remiss if I, if I didn't ask uh, about one of the more trending topics of the last year or two. How would you say that this integration of, of PAM and IGA plays into someone who wants to at least aspire to a zero trust framework or a zero trust model, if it does? Maybe I've, Mike and I are in the same room, so it's easy for me to jump in first. So I'll let I'll, 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 I'll the prompt afterwards. I, I think we're both in agreement that um, uh, any notion of zero trust, very trendy word, much used, right? Um, let's start with. with the general view that we are not only under attack but very possibly compromised. Um, as you look at uh, any form of zero trust, it says you have to understand who does have access, who should have access, and how that privilege is being used. And so I think uh, any thoughts around a zero trust program being driven from the CISO down, which often will come, oh, we got, we're doing, we're doing a zero trust here. It's all about network and perimeter. The first thing I would say is identity is at the center of that. So um, I think I, understanding those solutions and where they fit is key. Right, Mark? I'd agree with that. And the one thing that I would emphasize is Darren and I, while we were writing this, went back and forth on concepts like zero trust several times because you're going to find vendor definitions to be different than the NIST white paper definition, and in some cases, grossly different. And this isn't meant to scare you, it's just that. Until the NIST paper comes out of draft format, which it currently is, everybody's applied their own theory to it. So understanding what zero trust is in terms of an identity and providing that ephemeral access still gets managed by a governance solution, but the privileges that you give to it come from a PAM solution. When you link the two together, then you can really say, look, I've implemented zero trust in my environment to trust only when needed, only for the time and context that's needed, and granted the privileges appropriate when they're needed. If you extend this all the way out to the NIST white paper, uh, networks don't matter anymore. Lo location of resources don't matter. Containers, micro-segmentation matter a lot. So you have to mold your model to fit that as well. 
there is one caveat to it. Zero trust is not for everyone and it doesn't fit everywhere. If you've got legacy technology or technical debt that is heavily dependent on security being network-based, ACL-based, zone-based, where it doesn't have APIs for creating users, it's you know very uh, old or stubborn or you know closed, i.e. many custom applications, you're gonna find you can only wrap zero trust around its outside, not get it all the way in the middle. Uh, that chain creates challenges for identity governance and privileged access, but don't think you can put zero trust everywhere. You have to be able to make it work based on its proper definition, or at least what I'm referencing in NIST versus everything that you have today. Great. And then speaking, one last question, I think. Speaking of, of uh, outside viewpoints of PAM and IGA integration, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions over the last decade or two from security leaders who want to prove that they are um, good stewards of sensitive data or customer information or whatever else you're trying to protect with identity and privilege. And so one of the ways they do that is by responding regularly to regulators or auditors. Do you have a, any sense, uh, Maury, we'll let you go first this time, um, of how auditors are viewing this integration model? Is it accepted? Is it expected? What's the uh, viewpoint you, that you're seeing out there? I'm seeing regulators very pleased with the integration or the consideration of the tool tools working in lockstep. The, the caveat to that, which becomes a little bit harder is for an organization that has nothing, how do they start? Do they start with identity governance or do they start with PAM? And this is where the regulators become so important because you have to measure the pain of the organization. If the regulators are beating on you to say, you've got too many admin accounts, every user has two admin accounts, you've got to go solve that, you might start with PAM, just to remove admin rights on the desktop and then roll that into identity governance for better management. But if your regulators or, or your auditors are saying, look, you've got all these old users, you know, this nurse moved from floor to floor to floor and she has access to all these drug carts over time, she should not have access, you probably would start with governance you have to first measure the pain of the business to solve where you're gonna start. And then when you're able to link them together, then you can provide that coherent path to the regulator that when you changed a person, you added a person, you deleted a person, how they moved all the way through privileges becomes literally just a single set of reports versus I gotta go correlate this person here to this person there, produce two reports and then manually link them together. Regulators love it, but the pain point of where you start really is up to your business. Yeah, I'd agree with that completely. There's invariably there's there's a, a cause. Um, there's something that is driving um, us. And uh, just to finish on that thought, drawing out um, a program view that understands wherever you start, this is where you end, is, is expected. If you can show that to the regulator as well, you're you're really showing um, uh, that you you get your stuff together really at that point. So. Well, great. Uh, thanks, y'all. Um, so, assuming they want the book now, which is obviously what they do want, um, they can get it a couple ways. Uh, you see the links on your screen or by emailing Beyond Trust and Snailpoint. But I think the most fascinating way, um, it looks like the two of you will be at RSA this year. Yeah, yes. on the Thursday, the 27th, right, Murray? Yeah, we're going to be, um, we're doing a, a, a little book signing. Um, there is rumor of some free books for the First people's, uh, people that show up. Um, but yeah, please come along. And um, if, you're, if you're at RSA, it's on Thursday, right, Mario? It's at the th Thursday Bear, right? That is correct. Thursday Bear in the afternoon. Uh, the first 50 people will get a free book. And Darren and I will be there to sign and uh, take a picture if you'd like. If you are over the first 50, we're still happy to meet you and talk to you about uh, our solutions or just cybersecurity in general. And uh, in the chat window, uh, our moderator will post a hyperlink to the sign up for that luncheon so that you can get it. Yep. Yeah, perfect. And, and you'll I'll be just jump in. Even Thanks, if, Maury. Even if I was just going to say, even if you're the first in line, you'll be behind my mother. She'll be the first <laughs> one there. <okay. laughs> I'm sorry, Sarah. 
No worries. Um, just so you guys know, if you haven't checked out the um, chat box, that that link is there. Um, so you have um, direct access um, to go ahead and check out where the lunch is, what time it is, and all that fun stuff. Um, let me go ahead and launch this quick poll, um, and I'm going to do a little bit of wrap up. Um, but if you guys are um, interested in learning more, or speaking to us about IAM or PAM, um, please make your selections in the live poll now. You should see that pop up on your screen. Um, and just a reminder um, to be on the lookout for that post-webinar email. We are going to be sending out the recording, out the slides, and then a link to the RSA book signing lunch. So again, if you would like to hang out with Darren's mom um, at the book signing, um, you can go ahead and get in line behind her um, and meet Maury and Darren and have lunch um, with us at RSA if you're going to be there. So um, we'd love to have you have you guys there and, and hang out. And they'll be going into a little bit um, deeper dive in the book, right, um, beyond just what this webinar covered. Correct. We'll be doing a free form conversation about identity and uh, privileges and uh, answering questions from all the attendees, uh, regardless of where they are. Yeah, so come Thursday the end with questions. Yeah. Right. Okay, great guys. I'm gonna close that poll. Thank you to everybody who responded. Again, thank you so much for being here today. Um, to our experts and to everybody who attended live, we appreciate you guys spending the last hour or so with us. Um, again, look out for the follow-up email, containing links to the recording and slides. And everybody else, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, guys, for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bye-bye, guys. Take care.